And hey, by the way, congratulations. I, I should have said this Whoa. even before we started recording. Congratulations on getting engaged. I am engaged. I popped the question. I did it in the time-honored fashion of convinced her that in my hand I'd caught a big and rather scary spider and chased her around the house until she was petrified in a corner. Yeah. And then I got down on one knee and revealed it wasn't a spider, but in fact a ring. And she said, fine. No, she <laughs> said yes. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> And we're going to be getting married in New York, sir. Are you? Hmm. New York. Well, I am available. Well, I'll let you know when it is. And then, well, you might not need to. Um, we are going to do a couple of days in New York and then come out to LA for a few days and then go to Vegas for a couple of days and then fly back. Well, I'm available at all of those stops, it turns out. <laughs> Phil, I love you. I ideally love spending time with you. The very few times in our look, life we'll get to do it. But you aren't welcome to my whole honeymoon. Look, if you started the marriage by terrifying her, and <laughs> everything is looking up at this point. So, you know, if if we needed to share a hotel room at any of these places, I'm sure <laughs> that would be much less of a terror than being chased around, you know, with a spider. <laughs> can imagine it. We get to New York. Now, darling, I managed to keep the costs of these hotel rooms down by renting <laughs> out bed space. Let me introduce you to Phil. <laughs> Phil, this is my soon-to-be second ex-wife. <laughs> uh, well, you can come be the witness at my wedding if you want. Sure. Sure, I would do that. Indeed. Right. I believe you want to talk about dinosaurs today, sir. Yeah, we're going to do Gishoth. We're gonna, not going to do it budget. No. Yeah, we're, do, we're not doing budget. We're doing what works. And, and and we're not doing things like sneak attack yet. But, I mean, the, the deck only, uh, only costs $350. <laughs> Be, largely because of four lands. The three OG duels and um, uh, Kavanagh Souls. Or not. Oh, Kavan will come down though, won't it? Uh, only when it's reprinted. Mm, don't we effectively have cheapo Cavern of Souls now, though? Yeah. I forget what it's called. There is a Cavern, isn't there? Yeah, but the. the in this set, in fact. The, the one that makes it. The, the part that makes it really special is the uh, uncounterable. And that's what makes it used in modern. Y oh. Modern is hiking up the price of our cars. Oh, anyway, we should talk about this in a bit because you're Phil DeLuca. <laughs> and you're Sean Watson. And we are Commander. -in. Thanks for listening, everybody. We put a spotlight on... Oh, no, Phil's here. Phil's here. Sorry. <laughs> so? Well, I'll do it then. We put a spotlight on community issues, but never ever talk about three banned topics. Oh, yeah. Three. Yeah. Religion, politics, and Hearthstone. Hip-hop is off the list. Awesome. That's right. You can support us, of course, by giving us five star ratings on things like iTunes or wherever you download your podcast from. They really help. They really do help. Uh, you can visit us at patreon.com forward slash commander and MTG. And you can find us on YouTube as well, where we put a lot of this silly nonsense we talk about up online. This week, Phil, how would you describe what adjective would you <laughs> use to describe the show we have lined up for you? I would use wonderful. Ah, this week we have a glorious episode lined up for you. See, I'm mixing it up. Yeah, Keep you it are. fresh. So this glorious show is going to be one. We're talking about the brand new Ixalan legend, Gishoth, <laughs> Sun's Avatar. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. My dinosaur impression. Yes. Hey, Phil. What do you call a blind dinosaur? Dino didn't see? 
Oh, uh, did you think he saw us? Oh, funny. <laughs> God. <laughs> yep, you're practicing those dad jokes, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, I've been going to the class. Um... <laughs> well, in uh, both an effort, we're talking about Gishoth today. Uh, because I too am a father, actually, in both an effort to get my daughter to play magic, especially Commander, and my own timminess. I say we built a big stompy deck helmed by Gishoth, but really I built the deck. <laughs> because it has green and white in it, and we know, Sean, that you would never, ever build a deck with green and white in it. Um, the last time I did it was a uh, Selesnia... Selvala uh, infinite combo million year old deck. <laughs> That's very green and white, yeah? It is green and white, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about that this episode and I want to give special thanks to our $10 patron crew. I posted this link in the Facebook chat we maintain with them, and they gave me some really good suggestions. And what that made me do, actually, was reconstruct the deck from the ground up. And uh, it's a very similar deck, and it has some problems, and so I'm hoping our listeners will help us out. But first... We don't have any real news, except, of course, we hope that you will go up to our website and buy a playmat from us. Anybody who does gets a free Deadeye Navigator signed by Phil and Sean, or a God Pharaoh's gift signed by me because we got them after we were all together. And very lucky folks will get a foil version of the card. We still have a few copies of the foil version left, so... Hurry up, get yours now. So, Sean, before we roll into the main topic, you wanted to do uh, this <laughs> hilarious, uh, hilarious game so, you created. Tell us about it, please. So, what it is, I snuck into Mark Rosewater's office. Yeah. Uh, while they were developing Ixalan, which was, you know, it was a couple of years ago now, and I was intrigued, searching around for his desk for what the inspiration behind the theme of this set, which is, you know. Dinosaur Aztecs versus vampire pirates. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, or pirate conquistadors, or you know. Yeah. It was, and I actually found written on an old piece of parchment the Ixalan style Mark Rosewater new Magic the Gathering set generator game. So he has a set generator, like he just has this at his desk? Just, it's well, it looks ancient. It looks like it's been handed down from bored geeks and nerds at gaming clubs <laughs> talking about, it's called the, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we game? <laughs> all you have to do, Phil, to, we're going to generate a set, a new magic set for you. And all you have to do for me is roll. 4d10s. Now, I presume being a gamer, you have 4d10s to hand. Oh, indeed, always. I actually Excellent. do. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing I want to make clear. For us, this is a game, but for Mark Rosewater, this is how he determines the themes of each set, isn't it? It, it absolutely is, um, judging by the theme of Ixalan, which is awesome, don't get me wrong. But this is how we got to Dinosaur Aztecs versus Dinosaur Riding Aztecs versus Vampire Conquistador <laughs> Pirates. So, uh, Phil, <laughs> what we need to do is use the sacred Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did a set that involves we need a snappier name for it than that. Game, roll me in, and we'll tell you what your personal magic set that will be coming out after Ixalan will be. And you can tell me how that's gonna work. Well, you said to roll four ten-sided yep, dice. Yep, four d10s, and tell me the d10s. You told me before the show, and I brought them with me. So here, here we go. Okay, now I'm going to read them to you left from right. Three, eight, four, four. Three, eight, four, four. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, Phil. Well, I'm going to tell you now. Your set is going to be ninja guidance counselors. Versus slightly in or not, sir. I'll say that again. Your set is going to be ninja guidance counselors versus slightly annoyed trekkies. <laughs> wow, 
Wow, I didn't re- <laughs> I didn't realize Mark. <laughs> I didn't realize he started from this base. <laughs> but it explains an awful lot, doesn't it? It does. It does. So what I want to know is are they ninjas who are guidance counselors or are they or are they guidance counselors who specifically guide can give counsel to ninjas <laughs> i think i think you have two separate factions there ninjas and guidance counselors but there always is an overlap and so we know that ninjas are blue and black right because that's true yeah. right and uh because they're sneaky and they uh they, as as related to guidance counselors they're certainly intelligent and they're thoughtful which explains the blue and the guidance counselors indicate an emotional resonance so they're kind of red and guidance counselors are looking out for everybody so they are probably the boros faction of this particular group and so you end up with a non-green um blend if you if like a four color blend if you if you draft all of these in the set and I think that there definitely are guidance counselors, and they do things like they have uh, threat and effect, so they'll take temporary control of you for a little while. And then the ninja, of course, well, they're just full-on ninja with a return of ninjutsu. The uh, slightly annoyed... <laughs> slightly annoyed... Trick. I like the car returning mechanic in there. Nice. <laughs> and, uh... Are you sure you don't work for Watson? <laughs> Well, we're all looking forward to the return of ninjutsu, so. <laughs> now, slightly annoyed Trekkies. These are people who are frustrated um, because, you know, the, the Star Trek, they, they've they accepted Star Trek. And so these people are, of course, green. And <laughs> well, <laughs> this this manifests as, and, and they're, they might be slightly selfish, they might be slightly, you know, may, might work together a little bit, so that's kind of a wash. Um, but the slightly annoyed makes them definitely uh, red as well. So this is a gruel faction that will overlap right. somewhat with the guidance counselors. <laughs> because, of course, some of the Trekkies will sneak over and get guidance counseling in order to deal with their slightly annoyed state i think it could be a naya faction because to me trekkies they've got that kind of most trekkies are kind of slightly in love with the federation which is very much a a white organization it's very white blue yeah yeah so i think you could get some naya in there as well right do i think we should have another go phil (laughs) (laughs) it's a good set i'm not sure what are you going to call your set what's its name going to (laughs) be Uh, this one will be, it'll be called, it'll be called Dark Emotions. Dark Emotions, nice. Right, okay. (laughs) Good, I like it, I like it. So the, that's the first part of the block. What's, (laughs) what's the second set in the block going to be, Phil? This must be Dominaria, right? Because of all the (laughs) completely random factions. So let's... I guarantee that, because I got this from Rosewater's desk, Something amongst this game and this combination, many hundreds of combinations we can have here, will be what Dominaria is based on. So we might randomly generate it up. We don't know. Let's <laughs> go on. Round two. Here we go. Round two. Now, uh, are you going to define this set? Uh, well, I'll read it out. I'm quite enjoying spitballing here with you. We can do it together. Roll me 4d10. Sir. All right. Here we go. All right. Eight. Eight. Six. One. Eight, eight, six, one. Just inputting it in, if you can hear my uh, keyboard working on this ancient text. <laughs> oh, wow, right, okay. Um, so, uh, roll me that second number again, because we've already had guidance. <laughs> I was going to say, but if it's the second set in the block, that's the through line, isn't it? Oh, that's the through line. Okay, well, in which case, the guidance counts is <laughs> changing quite a lot. <laughs> so... Eight eight six one. So in this one we have psychic guidance counselors <laughs> versus obsessive compulsive ice agents. Wow. Uh... So they've stopped being ninjas and they've become psychics. Yes, they've given up their sneaky ways and have revealed. Actually, this is what's happened. They've revealed that they are actually mentally controlling everyone as guidance counselors. Oh, flip reverse. They're actually the bad guys. Yeah. 
Yeah. Whereas before they were helping people and, you know, they were really kind of trying to reform the ninjas. What they were actually doing was implanting their own psychic commands in the in the ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> so now they've mind control, um, they've enslaved the entire faction. And so now they're they're definitely black. They've probably dropped a red in favor of more calculating uh schemes. Okay. And the the um obsessive compulsive ice agents well th <laughs> this this is clearly a faction that wants people to uh return to their own factions <laughs> 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 and so what they've done is they've brushed aside the slightly annoyed trekkies who were probably just some sort of infiltration scheme anyway right well, yeah they would have been from out of plane wouldn't they the the trekkies yeah yeah, probably using uh, Nicol Bolas's new uh, planar bridge, which we'll see plenty more of. Indeed. And what's he done own the uh, rights to Star Trek? So they would have been loosely based on a uh, intergalactic federation. So they would have been called uh, Multiverse Trekkers or something. Yeah. And they probably belong yeah. to the United Federation of Planes. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> And and so these so, obsessive compulsive ice agents, they're they're all about they're not necessarily about freedom. They're all about proper structure. So blue has shifted away from the psychic guidance counselors was somewhat into the obsessive compulsive ice agents. And again, they're going back to their roots, and so this is definitely a green it's a it's it's a simic faction. Yeah, when I think of when I think of an evil organization uh relentlessly booting out innocent people from having fun in america i think of simic well this we're not talking about america <laughs> we're talking about these people who are all about <laughs> returning everybody to their natural factions oh uh good follow-up question <laughs> what can you name and describe roughly the artwork of the jace that will appear in this set <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I can. Um, in this particular case, it's Jace in a very cheap kind of three-piece suit where <laughs> he, Jace has been one of the aforementioned guidance counselors. And this is the new Jace, the one that has lost his memory after Ixalan. Yep. And so he doesn't really understand that he's enslaving people. He simply looks at it as, this is the best way for them to follow the guidance of the counselors. Oh, yeah. That good old Jay. Stick to the rules. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me, how many gloves does Jace have on? Well, in a twist, in a surprise twist, Sean, Jace is wearing a glove on his left hand. Shut your mouth. <laughs> I know, it goes against canon. But really, the creative team has decided that this is the best way to introduce Jace to a new audience of left-hand glove-wearing uh, <laughs> dancers. Well, I think it was uh, pretty prejudice on the left-handed glove community who liked to play magic that Jace only wore it on his right hand before. So finally, they're getting some representation. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, right. One more go, I reckon. What they, what they missed, by the way, the left-handed community missed, is that Jace is actually ambidextrous. Of course he is, yeah. Because yeah. um, why wouldn't he be? <laughs> <laughs> and this this particular set, this set I would, I would probably call Slave Ice. Now, I would, as your head marketer, be confused at whether this is another set in the uh, Ice Age block, though. So yeah, just be careful well, there. You might want to rethink that. Yeah, you're right. Maybe maybe that's not the best name. Maybe that, that'll be the development name for it, the design name. <laughs> right, one last roll of the dice. All right. We'll do a three-block set. We'll go old school. Oh, wow. We're going old school? Or maybe this is three plus one. Maybe this is the the, the first... Uh, whoop. Maybe this is the first oh, yeah, way maybe they this is the, the follow-over. Because they can... The Gatewatch. Yeah. Haven't been involved yet. <laughs> <laughs> right, D10 me, baby. I'm, just, I'm still laughing. Okay, here we go. All right, the D10s have been rolled, and uh, we have... Oh, interesting. 0, zero 8, 2. That's 10, 10. 0 is 10 on this. Yes. 
Of course. Eight, two. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is a good one. Um, okay, so Phil, your flipped over set is homicidal horse whisperers <laughs> versus Californian cowboys. <laughs> well. <laughs> Uh, There's a good theme going on there. We've got cowboys and horse whisperers. <laughs> so I'll repeat that. That's homicidal horse whisperers versus Californian cowboys. Oh, well, this, you know, th- this sees the return of horsemanship as a very, <laughs> very, very critical <laughs> Uh, mechanic in the set because you know both sides have horsemanship and you can only block horsemanship with horsemanship oh that's true but no creatures have flying thus rendering <laughs> the mechanic utterly pointless for the sealed and limited format <laughs> yes but this one like this one like many sets sets recently is definitely a shot at the commander and uh community where we we really <laughs> like horsemanship i mean we do um sun kwan is um yeah a staple in many decks i yeah. run <laughs> and and some members of the commander community have what some might call an unhealthy fascination with horses <laughs> <laughs> and this but this really caters to that group why are these horse whisperers homicidal, Phil? What's well, driven them over the edge? And the homicidal horse whisperers are actually, they're modeled after super dedicated My Little Pony fans because that's a, another Hasbro property and this is a tie-in with that particular Hasbro property. In fact, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> in fact, the promos at Hascon are all foil versions of Twilight Sparkle, Rainbow Dash, the, basically the five friends in... You know, the five main characters that... My God, I hope there are five main characters. Rainbow Dash, Apple Jack. Apple Jack. Uh, Twilight Sprinkles. Twilight Sparkle. Sparkle, sorry. <laughs> Rarity. Um, Fluttershy. Fluttershy and Pinkie, and Pinkie Pie. Pie, yes. The, so that's we six, only, We had to both look up online that, didn't we, Phil, right? We didn't, we didn't know that without... Off just off the top of our no. heads, did we, Phil? No, of course not. We wouldn't just randomly know that because maybe children have been watching it nonstop for the last five years. But I love Pinkie Pie. <sighs> She's awesome. Yep. Should we stop doing a Commander podcast and just do one of the <laughs> <hot bronies? laughs> So these homicidal horse whisperers are really upset over the cancellation of a traveling stage play in which five (laughs) friendships kind of were formed around, six friendships rather, were formed around the idea of um, magic creating some sort of bond between people. And these then, these people then would surreptitiously convince other horses, sorry, horses, we we do. I didn't mean to spoil it, but we do see a race of of horse hominids. Oh, horse tribal. Yeah, horse, and we'll oh, see plenty of horse cool. tribal, and that's what that crested sun mare was actually a precursor for. And what? Oh, it's teasing us. Yeah, it's teasing us. And so this homicidal horse whispers, who are clearly Rakdos, are attempting to steal the horses away from the California-like cowboys. Now, California, of course, doesn't exist in magic except as an island in Dominaria. And uh, so the, the California cowboys are, it's really, it's really a metaphor for these cowboys. And, and they are definitely, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that, that these are blue because they're always seeking to perfect their cowboy uh, skills. And as uh, Californians, of course, they would have to be white and green as well. And so this is a <laughs> bant faction. <laughs> I could do this game all night. <laughs> um, I'm just imagining Jace in a full on, like, proper bedazzled with rhinestones oh, yeah. cowboy yeah. suit. 
Yeah, he's done away with his... <laughs> with a surfboard under his gloved arm. <laughs> he's done away with his customary cloak and cowl in favor of a rhinestone-studded hat, as you have said, and what you didn't say, and I don't think you you scrolled this far down the, the, the splash image, he's wearing sparkling chaps. <laughs> 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 Just a note at the bottom saying, enjoy cosplaying this one, Gavin. <laughs> eh? Yeah, yeah. Gavin, we really do look forward to your cosplay of this particular Jace. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm, we, you know what? We will chip in for the surfboard, too. So. <laughs> oh, my God. We could run a GoFundMe. <laughs> Each dolly pledged by his one rhinestone. On Gavin Ver. That's right. Chaps. That's right. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, if you go to our Patreon uh, right now, actually, what we'll do is we'll put this up on our on the our products page. We'll put a dollar a rhinestone dedication, and you can actually purchase for Gavin's use in this cosplay <laughs> a rhinestone that will go on to his costume, and we will supply him with names and all sorts of. Uh, he he will express his gratitude. <laughs> And that concludes our in-depth analysis of Gishath's son's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, here we are talking about it. Um, right. So we should probably get to that at some point. Are you uh, are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. We've not done a deck tech in quite a while, so I feel we should go over some of the ground uh, principles of deck teching that we do. Oh, sure, you want to... You want to do this? <laughs> Cards we're probably not going to talk about. Like, Solemn Simulacrum, Swiftfoot Boots, Lightning Greaves, Soul Ring, etc. You know, yeah. if we spoke about how good a Soul Ring is, and every time we do a deck tech, we would... Um, <laughs> We'd have hours of praising. Yes. So, we're going to look at the more interesting cards inside the deck that's right this isn't my deck phil <laughs> this is this is very much your deck yeah what's that an eight mana naya dinosaur <laughs> it's absurd like you like listeners you should build a gishoth deck once if you are inclined to the timmy end of the spectrum and then probably never play it again because gishoth is actually powerful enough that people will save their removal to kill it as soon as it comes out. And to Sean's point as well, we are not going to talk about the ramp package in here. There is one. There, we might mention one or what two cards because it provides a uh, uh, an extra benefit. But otherwise, it's you know we're not going to talk. Oh yeah, well let's mention cultivate and Kodama's reach and yeah. So let's start by reading Gishoth Sun's avatar. It's five. Red, green, white, eight converted mana cost. <laughs> very reasonable for a commander. Yeah, very reasonable. Hopefully you're only going to cast this guy once. That's the, the thing. Well, if I'm honest, Phil, I'm hoping you cast him zero times. Uh, which is entirely likely, right? <laughs> Except the deck really at this point, then this is where we need the listener's help. Or it, it, the, the deck really doesn't work without Gishoth digging in and tutoring for the next dinosaur. Speaking of, for eight mana, you better get something special, and you pretty much do. It's a seven, six legendary creature dinosaur avatar. That means that it has the three strikes and you're out uh, commander power that, that the original commanders had, the Elder Dragons that this format is named after. It has trample. Vigilance and haste, Sean. Nice. Yeah, the haste is what makes it. Green, white, red, right there. Yes, it is. And it says, whenever Gishoth, Sun's avatar, deals combat damage to a player, reveal that many cards from the top of your library. This is important. Put any number of dinosaur creature cards from among them onto the battlefield. Onto the battlefield. Ugh. Onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Now, since this is happening after combat, you probably want to figure out how to get extra combat steps. That's not something that I have done with this deck. But it's an obvious theme, right? I would go down there, because that's how it, when I was doing um, Dragon Tribal, before the Dragon Tribal deck came out, when I was messing around with it, I, I went down the very deep red 
extra combat step strategy. Yeah. And and you absolutely should. And one of the one of the uh, pieces of advice I'm hoping to get from our listeners, Sean, is that is how to cut this deck to put even more dinosaurs in, because as you'll see, I just do not have enough dinosaurs for a tribal strategy. <laughs> I can't believe I'm talking about dinosaurs. I really can't. Like, it's nuts. If, I, if only another set will come out soon that has uh, dinosaurs in it, you know, in maybe three to four weeks. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope they come out with something like that. So the theme is dinosaur tribal, roughly, in Naya colors. And the cool thing about dinosaurs is you don't need a lot of them before they start becoming... A really big threat. Uh, the strategy is pure, uh, purely aggro. You are eating your opponent's faces. Sort of like Gishoth is doing to that poor hapless thing it's stepping on. It clearly... I think that's meant to be a sort of regular Tyrannosaurus. Yeah. Uh, a carnage tyrant. So yeah. Gishoth saying, hey, check this out. <laughs> so... Phil, I just need to ask why we're talking about Gishaf the card. Yeah. What do you think about that uh, Phyrexian symbol he's got on his chest? Ah, I was so hoping, genuinely hoping, you had ignored this card <laughs> and not spotted that. Because I spotted that and I'm immediately like, what is going on here? Because it is. It's a Phyrexian symbol on the dinosaur's chest. Come on, wizards. You do not need to stoke my paranoia. <laughs> Look, Sean, I have been on my personal Twitter account battling flat earthers for the last like two weeks. Oh, God. It is... Why bother? <laughs> it's like, sorry, listeners, if you're a flat earther, but um, I mean, I've literally been in a plane high enough where I can see the curvature yeah. of the earth. I can't see this. is. It. I feel stupid even defending the position. Right. <sighs> yeah, it's crazy. I was using it as a way to exercise, but um, it's just not worth it. See, Phil, it's right. Yorgmoth, right? He's got actually got a son, Yorgmoth Jr. And what do little kids love? Dinosaurs. So he's like, fine, we won't do the hybrid machine flesh abominations. Let's play with dinosaurs. Yeah. Hey, you know what? If you're going to turn anything into robots, they might as well be dinosaurs. <laughs> said michael bay <laughs> <laughs> you could do a lot worse than you know axe cop with your dinosaurs so axe cop. Oh, oh my god. god if you haven't read axe cop listeners and or sean you must stop now go read oh, axe read cop it. and come back good old wexler so strategy <laughs> <laughs> we get the dinosaurs out as fast as we can by ramping them. Eventually, we will build a version of this deck that protects Gishoth because there's no lightning greaves. There's actually no lightning greaves, no swift foot boots in this because I know that those are good. And uh, to uh, our $10 patrons who helped with this deck, as I said earlier, they were like, well, you really need some forms of removal and so forth. So I put those in. But at the same time, it's like, do I really want to use Chaos Sphere? Chaos Sphere, dear God. Okay, Chaos Sphere is a, a good include. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so some a few statistics. This deck has a 3.6 average converted mana cost or cmc again except for a few random decks we have always maintained that your deck should be below four converted mana cost so you can do something on average by your third turn there are exceptions like control strategies can take a little bit longer nate built a couple of decks that like his yaleva deck which is just like it's yaleva and then it casts whatever whatever he can from from the exile on cast, and uh, those can be any converted mana cost, so it didn't matter. He was never going to hard cast, or very rarely going to hard cast a, a spell. So we had some spikes, and I think your Silimgar deck is over four as well, but again, it's because Silimgar uh, is stealing well, the Silimgar deck cheats in the... Of the 29 creatures in it, I think 18 of them are clones. So I'm getting your super expensive spells yeah. for four mana, five mana, depending on which clone it is. So it kind of cheats in other ways. Yeah, and that's a really good strategy. Yeah, that's why clones are good. Yeah, it is. Anything you can do, I can do cheaper. <laughs> 
and believe me, I thought about clones with this deck. Like uh, the clones are actually a problem, which is why there's one spell in here we'll talk about. So three point six oh, average. Sorry. I misunderstood. I thought you were, you thought about putting clones into the deck. I was thinking that's tricky in Naya. <laughs> Yeah, that's the like we didn't talk about that set, but that's the fourth set from now. We'll reveal that next week because I'm sure she even will want to play this game. Yes. So we have 36 lands in this deck, only 22 creatures, only 17 of which are dinosaurs. And I want more dinosaurs, so I have to find which of the rest of these spells to cut. We have uh, six, 16 enchantments. 16 now. enchantments. Well, yeah, because again, I'm, you know, loving enchantments. And so I need to, I'm testing some of these to see which ones go. And I'm sure there are some that are just going to go outright. Th- so nine... For those of you listeners that haven't played Phil, he does love enchantments. Yeah. I mean, there are some that are just staples. Like, I, I don't, I don't talk about it in this, but Sylvan Library is in this, of course. and Abundance. I don't, I didn't know I cut abundance from here actually. Oh, did you? Yeah, uh, because my theory was I'm happy with whatever I draw. Sometimes I'm going to need something else than a, than a basic land, but this deck is mana hungry. Gishot's eight mana. So nine sorceries, uh, which includes the, some of the ramp package, nine artifacts, which includes some more of the ramp package, six instants, which is largely removal, we'll talk about, and two planeswalkers. So. Um, the first category I have, I don't, I don't break this down. I'm not too concerned about draw and ramp. It's scattered throughout this, right? But the, the first category I've got is tribal love, where you are rewarded for playing creatures of a particular type. And the first card I've got in here is, uh, is Steely Resolve, which I'm sure sees a lot of play in elf decks. And it's an enchantment. And basically it says you choose a creature type and then creatures of that type. (laughs) <laughs> okay. can't be targeted they got shroud they get shroud though if only that was hexproof eh? yeah it's shrouded but i'm not playing a lot of spells on my dinosaurs so i'm not too concerned and i recall seeing this when we were talking about tribal last year and the year before or whenever that was steely resolve is symmetrical so if a clone enters the battlefield as a copy of a non-targeted creature Guess what? Now that clone benefits from the shroud as well. It's good and um, bad, but there it is. Steel Resolve's quite good as anti-tribal tech as well. So if your opponent's playing, uh, what would be a good example, wizard or vampire tribal, where you're doing a lot of stuff to your own stuff, just name the creature, like a Voltron deck. Just name a Name the this your opponent. Yeah, it's a good anti Voltron. Well. It really is. What type <laughs> That's of creature is your commander? Awesome. It's got shroud now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe maybe this should see a lot more use in in uh, my own commander decks. But uh, this is my first time including it in a deck. It's also a little bit pricey, especially after these um, tribal decks came out in Commander twenty seventeen. But a bargain at two mana though. Two mana and Lordy. nine dollars. Yeah, I would use that as in a hate bears deck, absolutely, because it's almost like an enchantment hate bear. Yeah, it very much is. Next card, you've got a new one from Commander twenty seventeen. That's right. You want to read it? Well, Phil, you give me the Herald's Horn. <laughs> it's three generic mana. It's an artifact. As Herald's Horn comes enters the battlefield. Choose a creature type. Creature spells you cast of the chosen type cost one generic mana less to cast. And at the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature card of the chosen type, you may reveal it and put it into your hand. So you've got a 1 in 16 chance of getting an extra dinosaur, Phil. Yeah. Because one of your dinosaurs is in your command zone. Yeah, it's not going to happen very often right now. If I can increase the dinosaur quotient to like 30, that that would be more appealing. But this card, like that part of the card is just gravy. That second ability is actually just gravy because even though Urza's Incubator does this for two, uh, you know, does, does this and reduces cost by two mana, this is still a worthwhile effect at three mana. So, yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, Urza's Incubator is a great card. Yeah, it is. I mean, I would put the horn... Oh, God. I would put the horn into my Eldrazi deck. Sure. 
Mm, be very good. Yeah, because if it hits, if it hits, you win. It's just great. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Who doesn't like cheaper Kozilex? <laughs> well, your opponents mostly. But they won't care. But all they will see is the blind eternities spanning out before them. Yeah. Now, this card, Vanquisher's Banner, is uh, the reason that I really want to increase the number of dinosaurs I'm casting, because if I'm casting dinosaurs, I might as well turn them all into cantrips. Vanquisher's Indeed. Banner, yeah, it's from it's from Ixalan, and it costs five uh, generic mana. It's an artifact, and you name a creature type. It's an anthem for that type, so it's plus one, plus one. And it's creatures you control, specifically, like all new cards are. And... Whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, draw a card. Sure, I'll do that. I mean, five mana, I'm playing green, so that's like turn three anyway. So we're still in the setup phase. Mm. Especially if, if Kishroth <laughs> costs eight mana. Oh my god, that's so ridiculous. And then there are some other tribal cards, but I'm not going to talk about those. We've talked about those a whole bunch. In... Coat of Arms, yeah. Door to Destinies, um... All those sorts of things. Yeah, and, and some of them I didn't even bother to put in this deck because... Did you bother with the coat? Well, coat I know is good, and so it'll find a home in here at some point. Like, if if some other card ends up cycling out of here, I'm, you know, I'll am you happily put coat in. I've got enough coats uh, as well stockpiled before the, the, the spike, so I'm not too concerned about that. The big weakness of the deck is that there are some flying dinosaurs, but not a, not a lot of those are good. Like the Kinjali Sunwing is pretty good because your opponent's creatures enter tapped. That's awesome. But most of the time, yep. you do not want flyers to come in sailing over the heads of your pretty feathered dinosaurs who only wish they could fly. So you play cards like Gravity Well, one and two green, which says whenever a creature with flying attacks, it loses flying until end of turn. It's it's like a fun surprise, even though it's on the table. It's an enchantment. And Chaos Sphere, which is an oldie that Henry Stukenborg, our, one of our $10 patrons and editor of EDHREC.com, recommended in our chat. It's uh, Chaos Sphere is two in a red. Enchant World, Sean. It's a, it's a Mirage card. <laughs> now, two points to why you were going to Hufflepuff. If you uh, can tell me how an Enchant World works, Phil. <laughs> well, an Enchant World... <laughs> works by eliminating any previous enchant worlds that exist <laughs> on the battlefield. Correct. So you know that pillar tombs of Aku that I've had out for turns? Yeah. You cast your chaos sphere. It's gone. Destroys my pillar tombs. Yep. A lot of people are uh, familiar with, what is it, Concordant Crossroads. That's a one yes. green enchant world that gives all your creatures haste, but you know what? Incorrect, sir. It's a one green enchant world that gives all creatures Haste. All creatures, right. See, I, I slipped in the you control part. And uh, yeah. Chaos Sphere also applies globally. Actually, remember, Gravity Well applies gro globally, too. Um, and Chaos Sphere yes. says creatures with flying cannot block creatures without flying. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Which means my non-flying dinosaurs are just getting past all of those angels that people play. And <laughs> creatures without flying can block creatures with flying. So those flyers can't block my dinosaurs, but my dinosaurs can block those flyers. And uh, a tasty chicken dinner will be had by these dinosaurs. So, Does angel taste like chicken? Yeah. Well, wings yeah. do. Get some buffalo sauce yeah. in there. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> and I like mine a little bit extra crispy, so just leave it in the oven a few extra minutes. Yum, yum. <laughs> So card draw, there's some other card, like traditional card draw in here, but there are two cards I really want to highlight. The first one is an absolutely monster of a card. Yeah. I'm surprised it doesn't see more play. And I, I think if you read it, it will sound better than if I read it. <clears throat> Lurking predators. See? Four and two green for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell... Reveal the top card of your library. If it is a creature card, put that card onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you may put that card on the bottom of your library. <laughs> this is an awesome card. 
<laughs> it's yeah. Whenever your opponent casts a spell. Yeah. Dear Lordy. Including, dear listeners, when your opponent attempts to remove lurking predators. That's true. You do get a free yeah. trigger off of it. And uh, um, this one also, well, this was the very first card that Henry was like, this is an auto-include. This is thematic and it belongs in here. Why isn't it in there? And I was like, oh, you're right, Henry. <laughs> <laughs> I said it in that voice too. So yeah, lurking. I've used lurking predators in a couple of other decks too. It's, uh, it's, you you cast it. <laughs> you just cast it. You put it down, and you watch what happens, because that's like turn six or so when everybody starts thinking about going off and and laying down their their really big. Since we can talk about it now, that's when everybody is getting ready to bust a move. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, boy. <laughs> and so Lurking Predators is one of those, like, it gives everybody pause. Everybody stops and goes like, uh, do I cast that spell? And the answer is probably yes, because they're not going to stall. And sooner or later, they cast something. So I've, I played against, I believe, Chris Thacker with his, crash deck and he resolved a lurking predators i'm sure it was that and i was using one of my trixie decks you know which tends to cast a lot of cheap stuff i think oh it was ailey and it's just like oh every time i kill a creature <laughs> and recast it i'm just giving him stuff <laughs> yeah God. yeah please there's so much wrong with this in terms of when you're playing around it and playing against it. And it's just lovely. So thank you, Henry, for bringing it up. Because this card, more than any other, is what caused me to restructure it. But now, of course, I have many fewer creatures. So I've got to up the creature count to support this one as well. Mm. A, uh, a recent card that really is card draw with, with an amazing bonus is Rishkar's expertise for four and green green. You get a sorcery that says, draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. Now, a little aside here. Sean, I'm not going to have a lot of creatures out. This is playing, in general, this plays a lot like the Dragon's deck, which I don't know if you've uh, had an opportunity to... I know, I know yours is in customs right now, but I don't know if you've had a chance <laughs> to kind of look at it or, or study it. But the um, I've looked at the cards, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the way it plays is you get one or two dragons out. If you get three or four dragons out, the game is about to end. So you only need a couple of dragons out. Usually one of them is the Ur dragon, and so you're not going to have a lot of creatures out. The same is true with these uh, dinosaurs, because most of the really good dinosaurs are expensive. So Rishkar's expertise says draw a card you know, draw cards equal to the greatest power among creatures you control, and my commander has a seven power. So Rishkar's expertise is a seven card draw green card. <laughs> I like that. For six mana. But, um, and there's more. <laughs> I mean, this is incredible. Yes, you may cast a card. With converted mana cost five or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. A card, not a creature card. A card. Um, and you do it in order it's 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 uh it's on the card. So to resolve this, you draw the cards, then you can cast a card from your hand, which happens to be one of the ones you just drew, maybe. Or is another dinosaur, and there are plenty of dinosaurs at the five or less level that are utility. Plus, you know, you're playing other spells too. Yeah, it's good. Are you running like stuff like um what's that evil card that everyone loves called Tooth and Nail? That's a really power green. I'm just going to go and get the two biggest creatures and win I, type stuff. I am not. There are no actual tutors in this deck. So no fetch lands? No fetch no, lands. No uh, cheap fetch lands like Evolving Wilds? No no Evolving Wilds. I should probably put some in, but no, um, and probably will because that's mostly harmless, but they, no slow fetches as well, no actual fetches, no worldly tutor, no idyllic tutor despite the enchantment thing. No tutors. None. And part of that is because I'm just going to cast whatever comes up. I would argue, I mean, 
you could make an argument that your commander is kind of a cheater. Yeah, if it hits with all seven. But it looks in the top seven or so cards and says, is there a dinosaur here? Put it on the battlefield, why don't you? Caca! <laughs> yes, a giant caca. Because we all know dinosaurs are birds. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like um, Rishkar's expertise. There are other cards that do similar effects, but that you may cast a... Because it's an expertise, you get the free cast off of it as well. Is, yeah. I mean, that's that's a gilded lotus there yeah or whatever filthy ramp spell that you've um that you've just got because you're playing green mm, saucy like a delicious sauce <laughs> i mean it's like a Belbay's portal or vanquisher's banner right urza's and i can keep listing there's plenty of cards under five mana in this um and again, because the average CMC is three or three or less, or sorry, uh, less than four, it means most cards in the deck are going to hit off of this. So, all right, I'll do that. Including Iroas God of Victory. Yes. And he, or it, he, probably. He's a he. Yeah. Um, is part of the get in there package, right? Because uh, we want Gishoth to trigger its ability as many times as possible. So if you just kind of run something up against a big fat wall, well, that doesn't help. But if your Gishoth has menace <laughs> and can't take damage while attacking, oh god, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm living in the in magical Christmas land here, then. It's really, really good. And who cares if Eroas ever, you know, manifests? If he manifests, that's just gravy. Um, yeah. I like Eroas. I feel he's underrated. I feel that his natural place was in that Kalemni deck. But we all know about the flavor fail on that Yeah. Card. Kalemni should have a clause that says, you know, if whenever you cast a creature that's five converted mana or greater, or Eroas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, whatever. <sighs> Anyway, um, um, so yeah, uh, was it Ethan we mentioned that too, and he just blamed it on a different team. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Good work, sir. Good work. Um, that's uh, that's what happens. I don't understand why Rois isn't more widely played. I guess I think because he's I don't know. You're right. I don't know. He's like a three and a half dollar card. He's the least one of the least expensive gods. If not the least Farika, expensive yeah. god. And it's like... I think Farika's cheaper, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, because really, uh, not enough people have listened to our episode with the Stibs. Because if they had, they would be all over Farika at this point. Indeed. So there's a removal suite, and it's got some standard stuff. I found room for Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile, etc. The fun ones, though, just came out in Ixalan. The first is Savage Stomp, which is <laughs> glorious, right? And thematic. Right, it has a big brontosaur, I guess they call him a patasaurus, whatever, a long neck thing stomping on one of the coatls, one of the rare coatls pictured in Ixalan. Two in a green, and it says it costs two less to cast if it targets a dinosaur you control. Well, of course, it's going to be a dinosaur I control because they are big and mean and nasty. And you put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control, then that creature fights target creature you don't control. <sighs> For one green, Sean. Hey, Phil. <laughs> I was looking at your deck. And do you know what card you really need if you want manipulation over who attacks and blocks and stuff? <laughs> now, you're thinking I'm going to say Master Warcraft. I'm not. I think you should run Sorrow's Path. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> Definitely not one of the worst cards ever printed. It has, like, this super niche use choose I don't, I just, i'm pulling it up choose two target I'll read blocking it. yeah you read it yeah it's true i'll read it <laughs> no no, no like read the oracle does, does, does. yeah i'll go to sorry but i i do like reading the non-oracles on really old cards because they just like you scratch your head so um yeah it's Soros path um tap it's a land Tap, choose two target blocking creatures and opponent controls. If each of those creatures could block all creatures the other is blocking, remove both of them from combat. Each of them then blocks all the creatures the other was blocking. And, if you don't think that's awful enough, whenever Soros Path becomes tapped, it deals two damage to you <laughs> and each creature you control. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
I could see Raging River having a home in here, but not Sorrow's Path. <laughs> I saw that you've got Arena in here and thought, why has he got that in there? And then realized that Arena isn't Sorrow's Path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Arena is one of the other removal cards. That's three tap, two creatures fight, right? And yep, it's good. It's largely because Contested Cliffs requires a beast. <laughs> And these aren't beast lizards anymore. These are actual dinosaurs, so... Are you running Master Warcraft? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, you really should. Yeah, I probably will replace something. At the four mana slot, I've got Settle the Wreckage, though, which is the new, what is it called, Wrath to Exile? Oh, Wrath to Exile. <laughs> Two and white, white. Exile all attacking creatures target player controls. That player may search his or her library for that many basic land cards. Put those cards onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Every attacking creature which this thing exiles generates a basic land for you. So here's a thought. You're playing a token deck. Yes, that's exactly you it. You attack with your own tokens and then Wrath to Exile your own tokens to go massively ramp. Nice. Yep. I've considered putting this into Rith, actually, for the same for that reason. Oh, that Rith deck's horrible. <laughs> hey, you know, if it goes off, it goes off. <laughs> yes. Luckily for me, it's quite disruptible. Yeah, it is. It's super disruptible, which is why I don't feel too bad. If I can get... Basically, I have to swing with Rith twice and connect. Then on the third time, I'm going to attack with 40, you know, plus 40, plus 40 tokens. So... Uh, <laughs> not too shabby. Yeah. And if it happens, uh, well, it's not like I... It, it's on the tin. <laughs> <laughs> right? It says... Rith the Awakener, I'm going to throw 40, 40, 40 tokens at you. Next card in this deck, though, this other Naya deck. This is my fourth Naya deck, by the way. I think you have a problem. I might have a problem. The Demir addict. Yeah. Uh, Domri Raid. Domri might actually get used. <laughs> I like Domri. He's pretty he's good. Yeah, he's pretty good, especially in a big stompy deck like this. Uh, one red green. So for three converted mana, you get a now legendary Planeswalker Domri because the Planeswalkers weren't legendary before. They were just normal. It's like, oh, Planeswalker. No, no. Legendary Planeswalker. Three loyalty, plus one ability. Look at the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, you may reveal it and put it into your own hand, whatever. Minus two, target creature you control fights another target creature. And that's really what he's there for, right? And there's an emblem, which is, you know, you get an emblem with creatures you control have double strike, <laughs> trample, mm -hmm. hexproof, and haste. Yeah, that's never going to happen. Never. Oh, double strike onto Gishath. Yes. Oh, that's really yes. good. True Conviction is another card that Henry the Stuk Stukenborg recommended. Muffling can double strike all your creatures. Yeah, It's a little expensive though. Seven mana. Six mana. Three and three white, which is where it Oh, it's triple up. white. There you go. Yeah. There's the kicker. <laughs> so it's actually eight mana. And <laughs> three colors. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? It's like, ugh. So it, it's in, I think I, it's in this version of the deck. And if not, I'm, I'm just looking for room for it. It might be in the sideboard. Uh, and then Ride Down, which destroys a target creature, target blocking creature, and then creatures that were blocked by that creature get trampled, which means it's as if they were never blocked. For only red and a white, it's an instant. It's beautiful. I love Ride Down. The Ride Down's good. It was a really good card in Shadows. Yeah, it was in Shadows. Eldritch Moon, one of them too. And it was, I forget the original block it was in, but it, it does, it was like Khans. I think. Oh, it was Khans yeah. Atakia. Okay. And uh, it was great in Khans. It went right into Zergo, but yeah, okay. It was always fun when someone blocked Zergo. It was like, ha ha, ha ha, you can't, ha ha. And then I'm like, no, ride down. Ah. Now your next pick for this deck, it's a different category, but it is one of the best cards ever printed. It really is. And this category is Fast Dinos. And so, uh, Every other benefit it gets from these cards is is pure gravy. Xenagos, God of Revels. You want to read him? I think uh, this is another one that will benefit from your reading style. Mm, so it makes me chuckle because Revels is a brand of uh, chocolates in England. A very popular <laughs> brand of chocolates. So he's, uh, imagine he's got a little bowl of candy there in his right hand. That's actually what that is, yeah. Xenagos, God of Revels. Three in a gruel. Legendary enchantment creature. God. Indestructible. <laughs> as long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven, Xenagos 
is not a creature. Aww. At the beginning of combat on your turn, another target creature you control gains haste and gains plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is that creature's power. Six five. Ermagerd. Oh, Ermagerd. <laughs> this is the card that people uh, refer to as Xenagod because there is a Xenagos planeswalker as well. Um, this card is. I mean, he's his own deck, <laughs> and he's one of the easiest to brew. If I was saying to someone, "You want to brew a beginner's commander deck," you're really not familiar with the format. Xenagos, God of Revels, is. Uh, a commander, I would say, oh, you should bruise Xenagos. Yep. Yep. It's got green for the ramp. It puts out powerful creatures. The commander is really hard to remove. He's cheap to cast, relatively speaking. And uh, the, it's just fantastic. Yeah, it really is fantastic. Uh, if he ever turns into a creature, it's pure gravy, right? And even then, you don't attack well, with him because of all You don't want him to. Right. You don't want Swords to Plowshares to take out your Xenagos. For God's sake, don't let that happen. Uh, oh, the white player or the Orzov player will forever be sitting there going, uh, just let me know when he's devoted. Yeah, yeah. No reason at all. I'm asking for a friend. Just tell me when he becomes oh, a creature. <laughs> this one planes I've left untapped. Don't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> and so you do not want Xenagod to be... Uh, an actual creature it's best if he has has some sort of enchanting presence on the battlefield because let's face it <laughs> five mana for this effect is fantastic that's fine right because you cast <laughs> jesus you cast xenagos and it, just anytime you want whether or not your commander's yeah, on the battlefield and then you put the commander on the battlefield with gishoth he's trampling with haste and now he's a 14 uh 14 13 trampling hasty guy who digs as m <laughs> I'm sorry I lost it who digs as far down as he caused damage to a player he has trample he's a 14 trampling creature lovely it's not too shabby shall we say no not too shabby at all. And do you know how many people out there actually run uh, the ability to exile an enchantment card? Not that many. Oh, not that many. So once, once Xenagos hits the table, if you can prevent him being a creature, it's tricky to remove. I've I've resolved a merciless. Yeah, I have resolved a merciless execution just to get rid of Xenagos before merciless eviction uh, yeah merciless execution would be a combination of two <laughs> cards <laughs> that would be a really cool card though yeah merciless eviction sorry just and picks enchantment just to remove just, Xenagos yeah. before you have to exile these gods and act actually these gods the, the gods from Theros block are why almost all of my enchantment removal is shuffle that back into your deck or exile that because <laughs> yep. destroy doesn't work Absolutely. anymore. Um, yeah, my Ailey deck doesn't care about gods. Oh, right. lordy, my Demir decks really, really do care about the gods. It's so, oh, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. My best bet is to clone it and have my own one and try and abuse it back at you. <laughs> right. And that's not bad, right? That's not bad if you're the one who puts Xenagos out. <laughs> I love when I'm using Alien. Someone resolves Erebos, God of the Dead, and they go, oh, what are you going to do about that? I'm like, about a hundred things? <laughs> um, <laughs> I am in white. <laughs> just give me a second. Uh, I'm in Orzov. It's even easier. Yeah. <laughs> and my commander is an exile on a stick. Oh, God, I love that. <laughs> Xenagos is an example of, uh, he's in here for the haste. But the gravy is just that plus X plus X. And really, mm. the gravy is not something you can ignore. You're getting the gravy. <laughs> so enjoy it. I want Mr. Tumnus's magic gravy. <laughs> <laughs> what? He has gravy as well. Forget Turkish delight. Splash this gravy all over your dinosaurs. <laughs> Oopsie doopsie. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie doopsie. 
I appear to have got my satyr juice all over your dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Some other less obvious ways to get haste are Flamekin Village and Hunwear Battlements. You figure out what the theme is for Hunwear Battlements. Uh, it works. All you have to do is red and a tap on both of these, and target creature gains haste until end of turn. That's fine. And Hall of the Bandit Lord is another good way to get haste, and that's uh, tap and pay three life, so not even any mana. You add one mana to your mana pool, and if it's spent on a creature spell, that creature gains haste. So it's helping you cast the spell for three life, and after casting it, it has haste now, just without any real additional cost. And in Commander, we don't care about the life as much as other formats. So the problem, of course, is that Hall of the Bandit Lord is actually like a $10 card. So it's a little bit pricey yeah, if you don't already have one. All those Kamigawa legendary lands of even the really bad ones are starting to go up a bit. People just like lands. Henry made another fine suggestion here. To use flame. This is such a good card. Isn't it? it and it, it's it's a haste enabler, sort of? Kind of. It's like Riku-ish. Yeah. And if you're running, like, if you really go all out with the token, dinosaur tokens theme, that's next episode. Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying I'm having a week off next week, right? <laughs> then, uh, then. I could not sit with you and Shivam talking about no. dinosaur tokens. No. Can you imagine? <laughs> we'll do that around Christmas. Because <laughs> it's magical Christmas land there. So Flame Shadow Conjuring. For three and a red, you get an enchantment. This is why I have 15 enchantments in here. They're, these are all enchantments. Well, earlier when I was interrupting you about enchantments, I was going to suggest this card. So I'm pleased that you said, wait. Son, oh, wait. Oh, good, good. I'm glad we did wait, yes. Whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may pay red if you do, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that creature. That token gains haste. Exile it at the beginning of the next end step. So it's sort of like every creature you play now has haste. And you can just fire it at your opponent. And whether it dies or not doesn't matter because it's going away. And you still have the original creature. Well, and you double up on enter the battlefield triggers. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's half a Riku. It's great, Flame Shadow Conjuring. And it's like a whole 25 cents. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a great card. It's probably the card I pulled the most in, at the rare level from Origins. So I have a Japanese <laughs> version too. Um, I got seven, seven Mage Ring Responders, <laughs> which is the seven, seven for seven that you have to pay seven mana to untap it. Yeah. And I did genuinely got seven of them and I thought I was being trolled. That is horrible because that card is not really playable. Under weird circumstances, it is, and so listeners don't 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 tell us all the corner cases. It's a shame your deck is not black because <laughs> it could redo. I reckon with pestilence. Yes, yes, it could. Fortunately, there is a red version of pestilence called pyrohemia for two red red, same cost as pestilence, except red. You get an enchantment, one of my 16 or so, right? At the end of the turn, if no creatures are in play, sacrifice Pyrohemia. And for red, Pyrohemia deals one damage to each creature and each player. The reason this is in here is because many of the dinosaurs have the original Fungasaur power or or a variation of it. Yeah. It in, it's called Enrage, and all that says is whenever a dinosaur takes damage, do this thing. Draw a card. Create a token. Speaking of tokens, right? And and then other effects, too. It's just get a plus one, plus one counter, like Fungasaur, the original Fungasaur, which is in this deck, by the way. So Pyrohemia just pays for itself. The problem with Enrage is it's not really something that's supported a great deal yet. There's only like 10 creatures or so that have Enrage on it. And mm. uh, so it's I, I originally had a lot of Enrage enablers, and I was thinking of um, the red uh, Prodigal Sorcerer, Pyro, Pyro, whatever, Sorcerer. I put this in there because if it comes out and I've got an, an, an I've got an enraged dinosaur, might as well enrage it then, including turning that little tiny baby raptor into a three three dinosaur token. <laughs> <laughs> so 
No deck would be complete without a list of cards that I already think are on the chopping block. And that includes one of the brand new mana rocks, Pillar of Origins. As Pillar of Origins mm. enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, spend this on those creatures. And that's it. There's just better options yeah. available than all. I'd, I'd have any of the signets over that. Yeah. Like, it's really tough to justify. It's just thematic because presumably there will be some story element that describes the origins of dinosaurs or whatever. Hey. If only there was a card that allowed you to chat to your dinos. <laughs> you mean if there was some way I could say commune with them, since dinosaurs are all experts at reading body language. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just imagining interpretive dance with dinosaurs in order to convey orders to them. So when I look at this card, I go straight to that scene in Jurassic Park with the uh, sick triceratops. Yeah. It probably is puking right there. That's what that light patch is, not sunlight. It's been eating goji berries or whatever it was. <laughs> I like the blanket, though. That's a nice touch on this. You get For one green mana, you get a sorcery named Commune with Dinosaurs. Holy cow, my nose is all stuffed up. Phil's not well, people. Oh, but the show must go on, or we'll have a gap in Indeed. the release schedule. Look at the top five <laughs> cards of your library. You may reveal a dinosaur or land card from among them and put it into your hand. So you're not going to whiff if you're just looking for dinosaurs. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Yeah, I need more dinosaurs than 17 for this to really pay off. So um, It's all right. It's just, if it was instant speed, I'd like it more. It's a sorcery, though. Yeah. It's only one green. Yeah. It's all right. I... I if you played it, I wouldn't like go. I wouldn't look across the table and think, "Wow, Phil appears to have had some sort of brain fart." <laughs> <laughs> I would go, "All right, okay, he's being thematic." I, yeah, exactly. If I play this, you kind of go, "All right, I'm probably not going to whiff," and it's not basic land cards, so I quite like it in a few ways. As an aside, but related to commune with dinosaurs, I, I was very fortunate last weekend. Gavin Verhey came to visit and. Uh, we played Magic as part of a sealed, sealed? No, a draft uh, thing we did. And he drafted a dinosaur's deck. He just pushed it. It didn't matter what the dinosaur was. He just drafted it. And he took every commune with dinosaurs that came around. <laughs> <laughs> so in one game where he ate my face off, he uh, just kept playing commune with dinosaurs. And the funny thing, and what what made me realize in how much trouble I was, he... Every time he hit this, he'd look at them and go, mm, I'll take this land. And it, <laughs> and I'm like, he has a lot of dinosaurs. I know this by the second game. He's only taking land. He has something big and ugly in his hand. And sure enough, he did. Anyway, mm. Mirror of the Four Bears is the last card on the chopping block, largely because I need more dinos. And this says until so end this of... This is a dinosaur theme deck, not a bear theme deck. <laughs> yes. Ho, 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 ho. I know. I, I almost wrote that in the notes, like it'd be great in bears, but... <laughs> I guess you own the dad joke title. Today I do. Yeah. You choose a creature it's, it's type. It's two mana, isn't it? Yeah, two mana, you choose a creature type dinosaurs for one mana until the end of the turn mirror becomes mirror of the four bears there are only two in there though shouldn't this be mirror of the two bears but oh yeah oh, that's teferi in that artwork isn't it yeah i think it is he's all over this yeah. teferi's uh protection is in my maybe board because it doesn't fit thematically uh, but it's really I good i think you need like some ghost away type effects yeah in I was, Terry's perfection. I was going to call it, that. <laughs> and Terry's perfection. <laughs> That's as good a name as any for that card. It's pretty. Yeah, cool. Terry's perfection is a pretty amazing ghost away effect. Yeah, I mean it really is. It's worthwhile. One of the other interesting things about Teferi's protection is if you need a target opponent and you're down to just the person with Teferi's protection and yourself, Teferi's protection not only saves that person and all their stuff from your evil depredations, but now you can't actually combo off because that person isn't there to say, drain one life so you can gain a life and vice versa, right? <laughs> really good card, Teferi's protection. And I think it's at its low point at $16. And so you should pick it up if you can. But this Mirror of the Four Bears becomes a copy of target creature you control until of the chosen type. 
except it's an artifact in addition to its other types until the end of the turn. So, yeah, I guess if I'm not going to have a lot of dinosaurs, I might as well have two of them for a turn. But I can think of a lot of situations in which this is just sort of a dead card because I only have 17 dinosaurs in the deck right now. So, listeners, please help me get my dino count up. Dino count is one word. <coughs> What's the name of that awesome mirror from Amonkhet? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, that That's a... I would put that in over Mirror of the Four Bears. Yeah, that's... I think that will eventually find a home, too. And that is a Mirage really Mirror. good card. Yeah, Mirage Mirror. That's a card we should all own copies of, just to be clear. So you didn't go down the... So last question, you didn't go down the cramming some changelings in to be a cheeky... Uh, well, I did put a Chameleon, Colossus, and Torian Mauler in here, but, you know... You didn't fancy a Mirror Entity? All of my creatures already have very significant power, or most of my creatures have significant power and and nearly significant, nearly the same toughness. Some of them are pretty I tough. They are great big galumping dinosaurs. Yeah, and Mirror Entity is really great for turning a, a swarm of tokens into a gigantic, terrifying wall. And uh, my dinosaurs are already pretty big. I tell you what's good fun, right? Take control of someone's turn with whatever effect you want. Yes. And uh, if they've got a mirror entity out, activate it for zero. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Funny. Or if you have no creatures and you insurrection all of their creatures, then you mirror entity for zero. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> naughty. <laughs> naughty mirrored yeah. entity. Ooh, silly alien looking thing with a... It's basically an alien Teletubby. <laughs> So, <laughs> this deck is right. hosed by board wipes. Anything? Yeah, pretty much anything at this point. Board wipes, you kill Gishoth enough times and it becomes prohibitively expensive. Uh, it's really a fragile deck in, in most commander metas. I need our listeners to tell me what to cut back. So, please, tweet at us. Write to us at cast at commanderandmtg.com. Let us know what to cut. And we'll consider it all. We're probably also going to put this up in the deck review group for review on Facebook. So look for Commander and Deck Review Group on Facebook and ask to join because it's a closed membership to prevent spammers from joining us. Bloody spammers. Yep. Come around here with that process meat. Anything you want to add to this uh, this celebration of large creatures? Um, I'd cut the green and put black in. <laughs> Change the theme to vampires. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yep, you'd make Mardu vampires. <laughs> Seriously, though, I will be brewing for Ixalan. I will be brewing a Vona deck as a little uh, preview for a future episode, and I will explain to you why you don't necessarily always have to run Edgar Markov as your vampire general now. Excellent. Well, we look forward mm. to that because not a lot of people have Edgar. Everyone has Edgar <laughs> in their hearts. I mean, he is what he eats, right? Oh, snap. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Uh, we should probably go, shouldn't we, Phil? Yes, we should. So thanks for hanging out with us, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the uh, deck discussion, maybe as much as Sean, because we all know Sean is a secret Timmy. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us, everybody. Very special thanks to our patrons. As you heard, we spoke to our $10 patrons and actually Andy Bentelay. Mr. Andy Bentelay. He also made Mr. some suggestions and those are in the deck too. I just didn't want to highlight every single card that we talked about. So thanks for hanging out with us. Come hang out with us in the patron chat group. To join that, head over to patreon.com slash commander and MTG and uh, just donate. If you do $10 or more per episode, you can come join our chat group. Each week, we like to call out and thank three of you. And this week, we're thanking Jason Urin, Stefan Carlson. I presume he is at least of Scandinavian descent, if not an actual Scandinavian. One hopes so. We have a lot of Vikings and descendants of Vikings listening to the show. Yes, yes. In fact, Sean, this holiday season, your special episode, which I will not pronounce the name of, 
will go out to our listeners while we are otherwise uh, engaged with our holiday celebrations. Awesome. Yeah. And speaking of Scandinavia, I've been listening to a lot of Norwegian and Swedish black metal lately. <laughs> you should follow Sean on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, you should follow Sean on Twitter. Plus, he's recently been painting. I've been painting, yes. And and he does really good work. Well, you know what? We should actually talk about that on a on like Warhammer. a little episode lit. And yeah, we can do a little side issue. Our uh, third our patron, third <laughs> patron <laughs> Phil. is Colin Ross Matthias. Thank you. Is it Matthias? It could be Matthias. I just automatically went to the Latin route. So if you want your name to have fun made out of it, come join us on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we call out dollar patrons as well. That's most of our patrons. We do. So uh, please come on over, join us there, join our little community, and we'll uh, call you out sooner or later. And w without your continued support, we actually could not do this. So thank you very much for supporting us. As you uh, may be able to tell, we don't have any other sponsors. We are fully patron-sponsored, listener-supported podcasting. How about that? Yes, I think we're like the only podcast in the world that isn't sponsored by Harry's Razors or Squarespace. <laughs> or Card Kingdom at this point. <laughs> oh, what's that? I listen to a lot of podcasts. Card Kingdom sponsor a lot of people. Um, if you listen to non-magic podcasts, you'll all be familiar with Blue Apron. Yes, Blue Apron. Which is annoying because it sounds delicious, but you cannot get that service in England. <laughs> and uh, Audible. Yes, Audible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, someone Mattresses, I forget what they're called. Is it? So as we continue oh. listing <laughs> companies that are not sponsoring <laughs> us. <laughs> uh, we will not be taking sponsorship from them. Well, maybe Harry's. Yes. <laughs> so you should take us out now using our brand new commander in not always accurate but always entertaining <laughs> super sweet totally awesome super sweet totally awesome dude <laughs> <laughs> Commander in.